Let's sing together this hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King. Lift your voices. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice to Him and sing. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Let all things that create or bless and worship Him in The great Christian preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon once said that if a church is to be what it ought to be for the purposes of God, we must train it in the holy art of prayer. We began the year focusing on prayer, praying and choosing an individual prayer that we were going to pray for ourselves daily in 2022. We challenged you and asked you, to pray a prayer for South Hills for 2022 and to pray that prayer daily and regularly petition and engage God in those specific ways. 
And I hope that you haven't forgotten that. I hope that, that you'll be renewed and encouraged to continue to pray in those specific ways. And we as a church are called to take the gospel across the street and around the world. But also part of the church is caring for and loving one another through Christian relationship, bearing one another's burdens, encouraging one another, helping one another, challenging one another. And so this morning, as I wanted to lead us again in a time of prayer and to prioritize prayer in our worship experience, what I want you to do this morning is I want you to think about somebody who's on your heart, somebody that needs prayer today. Maybe it's somebody who, or, or someone or a family who's uh, battling COVID or dealing with some other sickness or illness or de- dealing with a difficulty or a tragedy in their life or recovering from surgery. Maybe somebody who's just d- down and out and, and struggling or somebody who's needing some direction or needing some help. I know there's somebody on your heart this morning. And I just want you to take a specific moment and pray specifically for them. And then I'm going to encourage you at some point today to reach out to them in some way. Phone call, text. Maybe when we're done, it's somebody in the sanctuary and you can go over to them and let them know that they were prayed for in church today and that they're loved. And so I want us to to pray for one another. I want us to be the church today and help bear one another's burdens. And just in this brief moment of prayer, pray specifically for someone who's on your heart and whatever they need. And if you don't know what they need, just give it to the Lord because He knows. And I want our hearts and souls being lifted up and our prayers being lifted up for all different kinds of people, but with one heart and one voice this morning, silently, privately, and then I'm going to pray over us before we continue to worship today. Let's pray and pray for those people that are on our hearts and are on our minds. Lord, thank you that we're not alone. Your word promises that you're always with us. You'll never leave us. You'll never abandon us. And that that we always have you. But Lord, in the beauty of the church, we have one another. And God, I thank you that we have a family, a family of brothers and sisters in Christ who, 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 if we don't share anything else in common, We have our faith in Jesus Christ together. And God, we need each other. We need encouragement. We need support. We need prayers. And so as all these prayers are being lifted up this morning for various people, may those recipients that we're interceding for feel the impact of these prayers. Answer these prayers today, oh God. We pray them in faith. We've surrendered them to you, trusting that you can and will act on their behalf. And may may it remind us that we're in this together, that we need to take care of one another. We need to, to love one another. We need to help one another. God, I thank you that we get to be a part of one another. And so move in our church, God. Heal the sick. Comfort the hurting. Guide the wandering. Sustain the weak. 
Be the God that you are in every individual circumstance. And may we be more determined than ever to pray for and to connect with those that we love, those that we care about, those that need the help and hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, thank you for the power of prayer, for the ability to to freely communicate with you, that we can experience your presence and that others might experience you through our example and through our life and through our witness. So God, hear our prayers today. We pray them in faith. And we trust you to answer them in your time and in your way. All for your glory. All for your honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand.
Let's just focus our hearts and our minds on him as we sing these words. I depend on you. 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 you. with us this song of commitment. Oh, be my life. Oh, I surrender. One day is better with you than all the world. Oh, spirit of life, help me remember that it is my pleasure to say to you all, my life defined by I've been crucified with Christ. The life I live, I live by faith in Jesus Christ who lives in me.
So in the fall, we began our journey through the Gospel of Mark, and we took a, a brief break and put a pause, pushed pause on the, the series for the Christmas holidays and uh, for the new year, and um, some sickness in our house uh, this last week delayed it another week, but now we're back in the Gospel of Mark looking at the life and the ministry of Jesus. We've seen Jesus already uh, in the first three chapters of Mark come to establish his authority, uh, to establish the kingdom of God. And in that short time, we've seen many who have opposed him and who are against him, many who have rejected him. But we've also seen many who are following him and surrendering to him as they've been amazed at the power of his message and his miracles. The, the authority that he carries has gotten the attention uh, of friends and enemies alike. And Jesus came to establish his kingdom, his rule, his reign, his way of life on the earth. To rule as the Son of God to everyone who would put their faith in him. And as he came to share this message, he knew and, and even said that there would be various levels of uh, receptivity to his message of the gospel. Some are going to understand, others won't. Some will receive his message, others will reject it. And Jesus knows that, that many are going to reject and aren't going to understand and, and grasp and embrace his message of love and grace that encapsulates the gospel. But it doesn't stop Jesus per, from pursuing to fulfill his mission to pursuing his purpose that God's called him to. And so as his popularity grows and his message begins to spread, we pick up the story in Mark chapter 4. So I hope you'll find Mark chapter 4 uh, in your Bible, on your device. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. Again, he began to teach by the sea, and a very large crowd gathered around him. So he got into a boat on the sea and sat down while the whole crowd was by the sea on the shore. He taught them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, listen, consider the sower who went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil and it grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. When the sun came up, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns came and choked it out, and it didn't produce fruit. Still, other seed fell on good ground, and it grew, producing fruit that increased 30, 60, and 100 times. And then he said, let anyone who has ears to hear, listen. So large crowds, again, people are, are eager to learn. That they're eager to experience a miracle or they're just there to see what all the hype is about and who this is that, that everybody's talking about. And so with the crowds crowding around him and Jesus needing more room, he gets into a boat actually and, and is out in the water and is using the boat as his pulpit, as his platform so that he can teach the people who are there on the shore. And he tells them a story, a parable. What, what do we know about parables? Well, parables usually give insight into the kingdom of God. Parables often use everyday objects or experiences in their current culture and life to illustrate God's truth in a unique way. Parables are, are designed to stimulate thinking and raise the level of curiosity and cause contemplation about what they really mean. Parables are usually focused on a single truth but not always. And as we look at the life and the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament, over one-third of his teaching contains parables, object lessons, 
connecting points to, to everyday life and society. Here we get one related to agriculture and a farmer who is sowing seed. We'll see parables about uh, fig trees and we'll see parables about fishing and things that were relevant to their culture. If it was today and it was 2022 and Jesus was teaching in parables, he would be talking about smartphones and making the connection to our spiritual lives. He would be making connections in all the different areas and ways of our lives that are relevant to us and things that we understand and objects that we use, experiences that we regularly have or or, or careers or jobs that, that everyone is familiar with. And by using parables, Jesus wants people to think differently in their everyday lives as they encounter these everyday objects and these everyday people and these everyday experiences. And so as the parable begins, Jesus says, listen. And what he, what he means is, listen up. Hear me. Don't miss this. Pay close attention. Listen, listen, listen. Jesus knows a lot of people are hearing what he's saying, but they're not really listening and absorbing. And even at the end, he says, let anyone who has ears to hear listen. So Jesus tells this story and he says, pay attention. Don't miss this. And ironically, in this parable, we see many who hear, but few who listen. So Jesus tells the story of a farmer who's sowing seeds, and it's a nice story, it's a meaningful story, but what does it mean? If not for the following verses that come later in chapter 4, this would be the place where we break it down and we explore it and we seek to understand it, but Oddly enough, in this parable, though I wish for my sake more of them were like this, Jesus actually goes on to explain and give an explanation to his disciples about what this parable means. Wouldn't it be great if all the passages of Scripture were like that? We get Jesus giving us a teaching, and then a few verses later, he goes ahead and explains it for us. That's the kind of teaching I need. That's the kind of professor that I need in my life. And we get that from Jesus here. Now, moving forward, we're going to have to work a little bit harder to figure some of these out. But before we get there, we see this private encounter with Jesus and his disciples. So it shifts from the public teaching setting to a private setting with his disciples. Pick up in verse 10. When he was alone, those around him with the 12, so the 12 disciples and those who were closely following Jesus, asked him about the parables. He answered them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those outside, everything comes in parables. So that they may indeed look and yet not perceive. They may indeed listen and yet not understand. Otherwise, they might turn back and be forgiven. In essence, Jesus is telling his disciples here that the gospel is difficult. The gospel is offensive. The gospel is hard to understand. And many are going to reject it. Many are going to rebel. But those who are willing to receive it, those who are willing to embrace it, can experience and understand the deeper aspects of who God is and his purpose for their lives. Now, now, understand, God's not purposely hiding truth from those while revealing it to others. But instead, he's pointing to the fact that his disciples are asking more questions. They're in, in inquiring a bit more closely about the details of these parables and, and these stories. And as a result, that's what's going to cause them to grow deeper in their faith and understanding and their experience of Jesus. Those that just take the, the, the teachings of, of Jesus at surface level and go on with their life aren't going to be impacted and changed by the power of the gospel. It's those who embrace it, those who draw close those who seek to understand and be changed by the power of the gospel. But those on the outside are just going to be left with these stories at face value. And so as the disciples pursue more truth and understanding from Jesus, they will unlock the mystery of the gospel. And Mark continues with the story and gives us insight into Jesus talking to his disciples with an explanation of this teaching, this parable. Verse 13. 
Then he said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. Some are like the word sown on the path. When they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word sown in them. And others are like seeds sown on rocky ground. When they hear the word, immediately they receive it with joy. But they have no root. They're short-lived. When distress or persecution comes because of the word, they immediately fall away. Others are like seeds sown among thorns. They're the ones who hear the word. But the worries of the age, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things. The desires for other things enter in and choke the word. And it becomes unfruitful. And those like seeds sown on good ground hear the word, welcome it, and produce fruit 30, 60, and 100 times what is sown. So in this story, in this parable, this teaching of Jesus, the seeds are the word of God, the gospel, the message of Jesus, and the soils The different types of soils are are the people who hear the word, who hear the message, who hear the truth and respond differently to it. The sower successfully sows the seeds, but then it's up to the soil. If the seeds land in bad soil, they're never going to establish and grow. Seeds that land in good soil grow and and flourish. And notice how the the soil types represent the hearts of people. First, you've got the hard soil. It says it comes and it's there on the path and the the hard, dry ground, and and Satan comes and snatches it up. Some translations say the birds come and, and eat it up quickly before it even gets into the soil. Those people who are resistant unresponsive. They give the gospel no consideration. And then you have the the shallow soil, the the, the rocky soil. The the, the soil welcomes the seed. It it gets into the, the soil barely, but doesn't establish roots because not far below the surface is the, 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 the rocky ground and there's not enough good soil there for it to really take root. It gets excited and it sprouts quick, quickly, but, but when trouble comes, or a better offer, the truth of God quickly fades away into the background. And there's no real solid foundation for faith. And then you've got the crowded soil. The crowded soil is, is where the seed is received well into the soil. It, it starts to establish, and it's actually got enough room where it can establish some roots and, and begin to, to seemingly grow. But along with the good seed are all the, all the weeds. And all the weeds are there, and the weeds are growing up, and the weeds are overcoming and choking out the good seeds, the good grass, the good plants, per se. The weeds of worry. The weeds of the world, the weeds of crisis, and the seeds never really get established in faith and don't grow and produce any fruit. And then you've got the fruitful soil. The seeds get in there and the seeds are rooted, the seeds are established and and crops begin to grow. And and worries and and wealth and and struggles and and sinful desires are present, but they're not strong enough to deter and hinder the growth of the plant, of the seed. And these people are actively growing in their faith and receive the fullness of the salvation of Jesus and experience the power of the gospel. 
So we have this seed, this, this, this word of God, the truth of the gospel that's being spread, and it's landing on all different types of soil, but only the fruitful soil is where it truly takes root and truly makes a difference. A fruitless Christian is an oxymoron, a contradiction. And we may not see the fruit, or, or the, the, the fruit may be a different type of fruit than what we expect to grow from our plant, or from our life, or from our effort. But a fruitless Christian is an oxymoron, is a, is a contradiction. And so Jesus explains this parable of the soils, of the sower who sows the seeds and the various responses to the gospel. And I want us to see two practical applications from this parable today, from this story of Jesus. First, sow gospel seeds. Sow gospel seeds. What I love about this story is Jesus tells the story. It begins in, in uh, verse 4. He says, and, and as he sowed, and as he sowed the seeds. We get this picture of a farmer walking through the fields. And normally back in that time they had like a, a, a satchel or, you know, I, I guess it's some kind of, kind of purse or purse or man purse or whatever it is. And as they're walking along, they just, it's, a, it's just a bag full of seeds. And they would reach into the bag and they would, they would throw the seeds. And so it says there in verse 4, it gives us a picture, as he sowed, as, as he was going, as he was living his life and doing what he was supposed to be doing, he was walking through the fields, sowing seeds. And as you walk through your daily life, throw out seeds of the gospel wherever you go. Kind words, good deeds, affirmation, acceptance, love. These are the kind of, these are the kind of seeds that our world needs to be planted. These are the kind of seeds that, that we need sown in our own lives. Share your faith. Tell others what God's done for you. Sow gospel seeds. Be intentional because it's not going to happen by accident. And I didn't just say sow seeds. I said sow gospel seeds. And you know why? Because we're all sowing seeds all the time. Whether we realize it or not, we're throwing seeds, and we're sowing seeds everywhere we go, and in everything that we do, seeds are being thrown from our life. Seeds are being thrown from our words. Seeds are being thrown from our thoughts. Seeds are being thrown from our actions, from our decisions. We're tossing seeds from our bag everywhere we go, but we need to make sure we're sowing the right kind of seeds. Our words, our action, and even our thoughts are, are sowing seeds, and, and they very well may be seeds of contention, seeds of complaining, seeds of division, seeds of jealousy, seeds of, of judgment, seeds of greed and anger and gossip and resentment and laziness and self-sufficiency. But they should be as followers of Christ and believers in Jesus who are trying to walk by faith and live the life that God's called us to live for His glory and not for our own should be seeds of grace and kindness and love and gentleness and acceptance and affirmation and forgiveness. You see, we're constantly having influence on those around us. So let's make sure we're striving to influence them with the love of Jesus, with the principles and lifestyles that best reflect the life and the purpose of Jesus. Christians, we've been made new in Jesus Christ. We've been transformed. We've been brought from death to life. We were blind and now we can see and we've been given hope and life and the promise of an eternity with Jesus both now and forever. Our lives have been changed by putting our faith in the crucified and resurrected Jesus. And the seeds of the gospel, these seeds that Jesus is sowing, are in us because we are in Jesus. We have the seeds of life. We have the seeds of hope. We have the seeds of eternity. And we need to be sowing them. We need to be spreading them. We need to be sharing them with others. 
Sow seeds of the gospel at home, at work, in the community. Don't worry about where they land. Just sow them everywhere. Once you sow the seed, it's not your responsibility anymore. It's the responsibility of the soil. In the car with your kids, at at home with your family, at work with your your co-workers. You're in the car with your kids and, and hopefully you're listening to something wholesome, reasonable on the radio. And, and a good Christian song comes on. There's some powerful, meaningful lyrics, and they may even be singing along. Take a moment and ask them, do you know what you're singing? Do you know, do you know what the song is talking about? Or, or they're doing their homework, and, and what does is, what is this word mean? What does is, what is dead, what does justified mean? Well, that's a good opportunity right there. You know, and, and you may... You may Tell them you may, you may intentionally use those moments, and you don't know. They may be very receptive. They may not be. They, they may soak it up. They may engage. They may answer, or their next response be, well, you know what happened in school today? One of these kids put a battery in his ear, and he had to go to the office, and then he had to go to the nurse, and then he had to go to the doctor, and you may think, well, that was just, that was, well, I mean, I was talking about something good, and they're ever talking about kids sticking batteries in their ears. Sow the gospel seeds anyway. You you never know where they might land. We're called by God to share our faith with others. And this involves small tidbits, daily moments of showing and saying how God loves us. Showing and saying how God's provided for us. Showing and saying how Jesus is always with us. All the way to telling people how they can fully surrender their lives to Jesus. And I know how most of us feel. Sometimes I feel this. I don't know the best way to share my faith. I don't know the best way to sow gospel seeds. Just find a way and do it. Just find a way and do it. Whatever way you're trying to sow gospel seeds is better than somebody who's not sowing gospel seed. Whatever method you've got is good. Often too much emphasis is on the method and not enough on the measurements. Often... Too much emphasis on the method of of how we sow the seeds. Same thing is true in in church. And not enough emphasis on the measurements on how many seeds we're sowing. You know, marketing influences our lives more than we realize. Go to the store right now. What are you going to see? Just prominently displayed in the aisles and the front of the store and in the main areas where where people are going to see them. Exercise equipment. It's a new year. Healthy foods. Diet foods. It's getting close to the Super Bowl, so guess what? All the TVs are going on sale and are on display because they want you to buy the big new fancy TV to watch the game with your family and your friends. You know, if you go down the cereal aisle, the cereal is strategically placed in certain spots. All of the attractive, yummy, sugary, unhealthy cereals are down low. The kid cereals, why? Because they're eye level with the kids. So when the kids walk down the aisle, they see them, they they can engage them, and they want them, and they try to put them in the buggy, which is probably why I'm still addicted to Fruit Loops today, because they're all down the lower shelf. The grape nuts, the fiber one, the Wheaties, those are hard to find sometimes. But you see, Jesus doesn't give us a specific marketing strategy anywhere in Scripture for the gospel. We don't have to craft it for a specific audience. We don't have to wait for exactly the right time. We don't have to worry about how well it's going to be received. The gospel itself is marketed for everyone. We're all sinners in need of God's grace. We're all hopeless without the, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Forgiveness is needed by everyone because everyone sins. Grace is available to anyone and everyone because we all need grace. Our target audience is anybody we can share it with. Do you want to help the church grow? Sow gospel seeds. You worried about the condition of our society today? Sow some gospel seeds. Are you burdened and searching for some hope in your life? Some purpose in your life? Sow some gospel seeds. Feeling down and discouraged? Sow some gospel seeds. 
needing a sense of purpose and belonging in your life, or maybe in the church. Sow gospel seeds. Wherever, whenever, and however you can, sow gospel seeds. Sow with abandon and trust God where they land. The only way we'll see a harvest is to sow seeds. Isaiah chapter 55, 10 and 11 says, For just as rain and snow fall from heaven and do not return there without saturating the earth and making it germinate and sprout and providing seed to sow and food to eat, so my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. We're not called to be successful. We're called to be faithful. We're called to be faithful, not successful. You know, the same sun melts wax and hardens clay. We've got to sow gospel seeds. I think it's important before we conclude this parable today to to not only challenge you to sow gospel seeds but to check your soil check your soil strive to cultivate your soil your life your heart your soul in such a way that you're receptive to the Word of God, that you're receptive to the work of God in your life. The soils in this parable represent the souls of man. Avoid being the hard soil and letting Satan snatch it up. Make sure that you're not the shallow, rocky soil where there there isn't room for the roots to grow. Watch out for the weeds that are growing in your soil, that are going to distract you and choke out the goodness of the gospel that God's wanting to grow in you. Be sure to keep your soil fertile and fresh so the gospel can take root, so that it won't get choked out by the enticements of the world and that it can flourish in you and through you. Because God's called us to be fruitful God's called us to flourish. God's called us to bear fruit. John 15, 8, my Father is glorified by this, Jesus says, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Our faithfulness in sowing gospel seeds will lead to fruitfulness, but our lives aren't going to be fruitful if our soul is not ready to receive the gospel. If our hearts aren't ready, if our souls aren't ready. And I think it's important, hear me, Hear me this morning. We are not responsible for other people's soil. We're not responsible for other people's soil. It's not our place. We don't have the power to control the receptivity of others towards the gospel. We don't have the capacity to change other people's hearts as much as we would like to. 1 Corinthians 3, beginning in verse 5, Paul says, what is... What then, is, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? They're servants through whom you believed. And each has the role the Lord has given. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's co-workers. You are God's field. God's building. God is the one who will grow the seeds of the gospel. We're not responsible for other people's soil. We are responsible for our own soil. We can determine how receptive we are to God's truth through Jesus Christ. We can work to be fully surrendered to Jesus so that He can change our hearts. You see, a good crop is determined by the condition of the soil. And we need to do some tests. We need to do some soil sampling in our own lives 
I've had soil samples uh, done in my yard before. I've had them done uh, recently uh, into the house that, that we moved into last year because, to be honest, I'm dealing with all four types of soil that are described here in my yard right now. This parable has come to life at my address at the preacher's house. I mean, there's places that are hard and dry and cracked, and barring a miracle of Jesus himself, grass is not going to grow. And it, it infuriates me. It drives me crazy. There's, there's, there's parts that, that, are, that, are, that are rocky and thick, and man, I think the grass is going to grow, but there's just, there's just not enough good soil there, and they end up being bare spots as well. And then there's weeds. Man, they're weeds. If any student or kid wanted to become a millionaire, I'd pay you a penny a weed and you'd be rich real quick in parts of my yard. No matter what, just choking out the grass, continually trying to pull it. And then there's spots of the yard. Those are the spots like when I'm done mowing and it's at the height of the thing that I'm the weirdo that's out there just like staring at it. I'm like, it's so beautiful, so thick and so plush and so healthy and so wonderful. And as I look across my yard, I look at my own life. What, what, where, what, where am I? Which kind of soil am I? Or God begins to even break down in my own heart and my own life. What about this part of your life, the, the family part of your life? What about the, the career part of your life? What about your, 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 your relationships or your, your, your school or your, your extracurricular activities or, or, or that? And he causes me to examine my own life and do some soil sampling myself to determine what it needs to happen and what needs to take root in me so that the seeds of the gospel can grow bountifully and flourish in me and through me. And so I ask you today, is your heart receptive to the call of the surrender from Jesus? And are there areas of your life that need to be cultivated so that the gospel can grow? Let's pray. God, thank you for this story from Jesus, this passage of Scripture that challenges us to think about what it means to sow seeds of the gospel. And Jesus knew full well, and Lord, we know that, that Jesus knew that, that his seeds of the gospel and his, his teaching and preaching were going to land in different places and different levels of receptivity. But that didn't stop him from continuing to fulfill the purpose that God had for him, to continuing to sow the seeds of love and grace and truth that come from you. And God, may we be inspired by that today. May we challenge to be people of the gospel, sowing seeds of the gospel. But Lord, as we sow those seeds, not worrying about so much where they're going to land and how well they're going to be received, but just how many seeds we can get out there because surely they're going to grow somewhere in a way or a time different than maybe what we expect or want. And then God, on the other side of that, That as you and others are sowing seeds of the gospel in our lives, how receptive are we to the correction, to the, to the guidance, to the help that you're offering us in our lives? The greatest of that being the help and hope of salvation through Jesus Christ who died for us and rose again that we might have life, eternal life, abundant life. God, if someone's not received that today, may they be receptive to the gospel today. And in and through your word, may it shape us and mold us to be the people of God that you've called us to be. Empower us to sow seeds of the gospel for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and let's...
sing and worship in response to God's Word and God's presence today. And if you need Jesus and you need to receive the gospel, you need that hope of Christ, will you come and let me or Andy share that hope with you today? You need prayer, you need encouragement, you have a decision you need to make. We're here for you, ready to receive you, ready to welcome you. Will you come as we sing and as we worship? Thanks again for being with us this morning. Thank you so much for being here again to our guest Sunday morning, or whether it's at another time during the week. We're so grateful that you've chosen to participate with us this week. If you want to know more uh, about what's going on in the life of our church, make sure you're receiving our digital bulletin. You can find it on our website, but you can also contact us and give us your email address, and you'll receive that every Sunday morning in your inbox. You can also give online through our website. Uh, much of our giving takes place in that manner, and we're so grateful to have the technology to be able to do that. And so you can find that information on our website and here on the screen as well. Uh, to our guests, thank you for being with us today. We want to connect with you. We want to get to know you better. We have a connection card, a guest card, that's available on our website as well. Please fill that out and reach out so that we can have some information about you. We want to get to know you better. We want to share with you more about the life of our church. I want to invite all of you who are joining us online to join us in person on Sunday mornings. Our small groups, our Bible study classes are meeting together at 9 a.m. 
in person now uh, after over a year of doing online only. And we're so grateful for that. So join us at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. There's a group, a class for you, at any age, any phase of life. And especially we want you to join us for worship at 1030 on Sunday mornings right here uh, in our sanctuary. We're so thankful uh, for each and every one of you. We're so thankful to be able to worship together, to share God's word together, to pray together. Is there a decision that God's calling you to make? Has God spoken to you in a special way today? Maybe he's challenged you with something uh, that you need to do in your life, some areas of your life that you need to, to renew or to refocus. Uh, maybe there's a burden for some prayer needs in your life. We have a place where you can share prayer requests, and we would love to pray with you and for you for whatever it is that you need or that you want us to pray about. But most importantly, we want you to know that we want you to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I know that in my life, uh, all the years that I've followed him and served him and trying to grow in my faith and better understand who he is and better understand his purpose for my life, I can't imagine navigating the difficulty of life without a personal relationship with him. You can surrender your heart to Christ today. We would love to talk to you about what it means to follow Christ and to give your life to him. And we also want to help you get connected in ways that you can serve right here in our church, in our community. We're excited about partnering with many organizations in our community, partnering with other believers and other groups within our church to help meet the needs inside the church and outside in the community. And all that we strive to do, our purpose, our mission, our goal, is helping people find and follow Jesus. So come and join us and be a part of what God is doing here at South Hills Baptist Church.